Welcome to Marvel Vision, a podcast about Marvel, the MCU, and right now, a bunch of news items. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. Let's talk news. And if you want to talk news or got tips or stories you want us to cover in the Marvel Universe, you can hit us up at comicbookclublive at gmail.com or hit us up anywhere socially. But let's jump into it. There's a bunch of stuff we need to catch up on. We've been very much head down in Secret Invasion, covering oh, that yeah. show that we did not like we talked about it (laughs) yes we we did we talked a show that we talked about but there are a couple of other things that we could probably catch up with news items that have popped up over the past couple of weeks so let's jump into it it's not new anymore but a new the marvels trailer dropped online with a better look at the plot of the movie did you get to check that out what was your thought are you still psyched for the marvels well it's funny in this the marvels it feels a little bit like all these DC movies we've been talking about where it's uh, everyone's like, no, no, these are going to be really good. And then we're going to do something new that you're going to love. And mm-hmm. the Marvels feels like it's in that same zone. And the new trail, I think the, the I think it's f- fine. The case that the, the trailers are making are like, this movie does seem fun. It feels like it has a really strong comedic game and comedic mm-hmm. center to the story, which feels cool. I think it's, like we talked about, the whole idea of this movie feels a little strange. It doesn't feel like this is everyone's number one choice. It feels like something where like, well, it makes sense to do this. But uh, I think it, it feels like it has a little bit of that, like this movie is not the right movie for right now, stink to it, that we've mm-hmm. been talking about on the other uh, DC I, I think I go in the opposite direction from you. I, I mentioned this before when we talked about the first trailer, but I'm just a total sucker for whatever reason for body switching comedies. And I love the concept. It's a here. very specific kink. It Alex. is a very, very specific, specific kink, kink, but I really enjoy it. And I love the idea of these three characters of Kamala Khan, of Monica Rambeau, and Carol Danvers all switching bodies every time they use their powers. I really do hope they keep it going over the course of the movie. That's one of the hardest things to do when you're doing a comedic concept like that, because it feels like the sort of thing they could spend early in the first half of the movie. The characters figure it out, and then we don't play on it at all. So we'll see. Well, and and that, I think, is the trick of this movie, because that could be, based on the trailers, a scene then mm-hmm. just as that, and then the rest of the movie is something else, or it could be something that lasts. I sort of hope it becomes how they win in the end. Mm-hmm. Like they actually sort it out and worked. It's like a great team dynamic uh, well, narrative. Well, it seems to build like around. there's there's the shots of them having the training session. Clearly, Carol is figuring out how to get them to work as a team. And then there's the shot towards the end of the trailer where they're fighting a generic Cree villain who says that Karen Leandros has taken everything from her. And they're fighting her, and all three are jumping at her together, which I assume is the final fight of the movie where they finally figure this out. Um, but I want to, I want to. Captain Marvel actually did a good job of being a comedy throughout with a deep well of emotion throughout it at the same time. So if they can bring that back for this movie, I'll personally be very happy watching it. Uh, Here's the other thing that Mm. I'll throw out off of this, which I think you're touching on here that we mentioned at the end of our last Secret Invasion podcast, but didn't really talk about is where are we at culturally with the MCU at this point? And and to give Mm. it a little bit more of a framing, We talked a bunch, a bunch, like throughout phase four, but particularly over the course of the podcast this year about how Ant-Man and the Lost Quantumania did not do well. Didn't do well, led to a lot of big seismic changes behind the scenes at Marvel's, a lot of like griping and hand wringing. And then we talked about how, okay, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, we feel very confident in that. Clearly that did well. It's one of the top movies of the year. But is that is that a win for Marvel? Is that a win for James Gunn? Is that a win for both? And to add the last final piece here, at least I had thrown out that I do think Secret Invasion is part of that puzzle. If that does great, as we hope it did at the beginning, like, great, Marvel's maybe back and we feel like a little tentative about it, but we'll see. Secret Invasion was not great, was yeah. a huge bomb. Uh, I know people, some people liked it, mind you, I don't want to discount that, but at the same time, culturally, that is not the win that Marvel needed going into the Marvels. So that's a lot of preamble to say, where does that leave us now? Yeah, I I think the exact same thing. Like, Seeker Invasion was like, oh, they're ramping up, they're about to maybe hit a couple, string together a few successes in a row. And it was just a galactic miss. And with with such a high level cast, with everything in place, it just was a huge whiff, I think. 
I think to us personally, but also like we're going to talk about in a minute to the the world at large, I think, at least to some degree as well. So the pressure is on for the Marvels. And I also think Carol Danvers in the MCU has not it's not aging well is not like really what people I think that first movie everyone's like okay good but now everyone's looking back and I think people like like her less like Captain Marvel less and I'm not saying that's right but that's what I feel like now we're we're pinning this movie on her as the lead and that she has less uh less power right now uh here's what I think maybe you're pointing towards just to sort of clarify and correct me if this is wrong but I think we got that first movie and then we got her showing up in Endgame. And then every other time there's been like Carol Danvers, Carol, like people mention her all the time, but we haven't seen her really pop up other than that end tag scene in Mouse Marvel. So it's become this like, it has become all of this poochy thing in the MCU where it's like, whatever, yes, Carol that's Danvers great. isn't here, mention Carol Danvers so people know that she's around. And if they had done a sequel immediately, I think we'd feel very different about it because we'd know and understand more about her character. So I, I'm clarifying this because I want to be clear. I don't think you're saying like the misogynistic, like ugh, Carol Danvers thing. No. This is more about we got to know more about her. All we know is she's powerful and people refer to her all the time. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. It's like you're saying the whole MCU has been like this, my coolest friends coming to the party soon. And we're still waiting for, for that cool friend to show up. Yeah. So I will say conversely though, something that really got me in the trailer is that scene where each of the characters say higher, further, faster. I got choked up. I was like, oh, my emotional trigger for that is still there. That's cool. Glad to see that. Probably going to end up crying at some point in this movie out of absolutely nowhere. So so we'll see. Like, I, I think... I think to that point, I understand what you're saying in terms of the arc of the MCU, but as long as this movie is good and fun and does reveal more about Carol Danvers, let Brie Larson do her thing. She's a great actress. I'm going to be very happy with it. In terms of the overall span of the MCU, though... I still think we're in this place because of the failure of Secret Invasion of like, not that all the hopes lie on the Marvels, but if the Marvels is good, people are like, great. What's the next thing? You got to yeah. you got to succeed again, guys. So we'll see. Well, and I think I think what you're saying is like, we're not we're the same audience. Everyone talks about how like superhero movies have lost it or whatever, but we're the same people. We respond to the same emotional triggers like give us those. But at the same time, we are tapping our foot a little bit. And it happens faster and faster to be like, what is all this? What are you going toward? I need you to give me more of a roadmap. That's what we talked about with phase four specifically, or I did anyway. There's this feels like a mishmash when the whole thing is like, we got this figured out. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I, you know, to take a little bit of a side trip here, we've talked about this a lot, but obviously the WGA and SAG strikes are going on now. We support those unequivocally. The writers and actors are 100% fighting for their rights, fighting for the money they deserve. Um, but on the Marvel Studios side, they've got a pause here. They really need to use this pause to figure their stuff out. Obviously, they can't do yeah. it completely because the writers aren't there, but a lot of the stuff is exec driven. And at the very least, they need to figure out like, do we need to be doing all of these TV shows? Do we need to be doing all of these movies? Do we need to do Secret Wars and Kang Dynasty in the same way? Is this story working? And a lot of that stuff is probably on hold at the current time, but I think they really need to look very carefully about that and figure out what they're doing forward. Not just so the movies and TV shows are a success, but like for the longevity and legacy of the MCU. Um, yeah, anyway. exactly. Let's move on to a little bit of a lighter thing here. Catherine Newton's screen test for Kate Bishop on Hawkeye dropped online. This is a part of a special feature on Ant-Man and the Lost Quantumania, I think. And obviously she didn't get the role, but it was very fun and interesting to see these scenes of Catherine Newton playing opposite Jerry Redder as Hawkeye. Uh, what do you think about that? Would you want to see her as Kate Bishop or do you prefer Haley Steinfeld? Uh, I like uh, Haley Steinfeld. I think just before we get to that, I think it's weird that when these get out, mm -hmm. the screen test, because and I I like, you know, I like watching them. It's very like, you know, uh, we're sort of let behind the scenes into a secret. But I also think I'm like, I is this a private? How, do you know <laughs> mm -hmm. this is out there? This is your secret vulnerable thing. Like, why am I watching it? 
Well, it does feel a little bit, and I'm sure I'm sure she's fine because she booked Ad Bad of the Wasp, but whatever. But it sort of feels like, hey, here's a time you failed. Check it out, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I know. Bye. I'm like, unless they, unless the actor themselves is saying like, hey, this is funny. I went in for this. I'm fine with it. I'm like, this is their private failure. <laughs> why are we, why are we all talking about it? But she does, I believe, uh, I didn't watch the whole clip, but I believe she is talking about it behind the scenes. So she, clearly she's fine with it. Clearly she did Am I in the Wasp Quantum Media, so it's okay. I think Haley Steinfeld crushed it as Kate Bishop. Yeah. She was great. I really like Catherine Newton as well. I don't think she was shown off to the best capacity in Am I in the Wasp Quantum Media, but yep. I'd love to see the two of them interact in the future. That would be fun. They're both fun actresses that I think would be enjoyable in some sort of young avengers thing or something like that but oh yes i mean i'm that's a movie and an idea we haven't talked about in a while that i think the mcu is pointing at i guess we have to do thunderbolts first sure. but that's a very well yeah you psyched is that I, for I don't know i don't know i'm i'm very iffy about everything going forward i want them to like scrap everything and start fresh just just figure it wow. out wow everything you're everything. out on king everything wow. No, Thunderbolts could be good. Listen, it's a good cast, so we'll see what happens. But, like, I'd be way more into Young Avengers. The cast that they've already started to set up is great. It would bring... This is gonna sound. This is the oldest thing I've ever said on any podcast, but it would be bring a youthful, fresh energy to the MCU. (laughs) Nice, good. I love to see other young people on their skateboards. They make videos for TikTok. Did you have you seen that? Oh, no. I've seen a couple of them on Facebook, but I didn't like it. It's like a very short movie. Ah, interesting. Hmm. No, if I don't watch movies anymore, the movie theaters are too loud and noisy <laughs> with their youthful energy they bring to the movie theaters. I don't like that there. Edgar, you were a viral on Vine, right? In your youth? <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Don't get me started. Wild. Bring back Vine. Vine was good. Anyway, why don't we move on talk about Secret Invasion, as you teased earlier. The final episode is the lowest ever Rotten Tomato score in MCU history. Overall, it is rotten. Now... If you listen to Sons of a Gun, our DC podcast, you may have heard a similar conversation about this, but I'll just put out here for our Marvel Vision listeners. I am very iffy about Rotten Tomatoes scores in general. I'll point to, in particular, people like, woof, lowest Rotten Tomatoes score ever in MCU history. That's bad. If you look at it, it's from 10 reviews, which is not a great yeah. sample set, just in general. It's no. not like... It's it's not even Ant Man of the Wasp Quantumania, which probably at this point has over two or three hundred views or something like that. So say what you want about that, but at least that's a bigger size to look at. Here you're talking about ten people. If five of them didn't like Secret Invasion and the other five did like it, you've got a rotten show. That's you got rotten. You got rotten. You got rotten. And in general, uh, again, like I talked about on the Sons of the Gun podcast, if you listen there, but the Rotten Tomatoes score is partially provided by the reviewers, but for the most part, it's Rotten Tomatoes taking a quick look through a review and saying, okay, binary, look at this. Is this fresh or rotten? Great. That's how we're assigning it. And that's how they get the score. So it's more, I think you said, give it a vibe check, like is the sort of thing, like we agree, Secret Invasion, definitely rotten in my mind. Not good. But at the same time, take a look at it and then make your own decisions based on that. Well, and I also think it's one thing if it's a movie where you're like, I want to figure out if I want to pay a bunch of money, whether it's just the ticket or you're like, I'm paying my babysitter four times what this movie costs to go see it. Like, I need to know if I I want to have enough of an indicator if this is worth it. But we're talking right now about pressing play on an app that you have with with (laughs) Secret Invasion. It's like, give it a shot. I say give yeah. it a shot for a little bit. There's totally. no uh, not, there no were, big barrier to There were some good things there. in it. As an Olivia Coleman show, she's good in everything. So happy to see that. Yeah, we, we need the fan cut of just the Coleman scenes mm-hmm. and uh, throw in a couple, uh, the fight from the last episode and, and Fury doing one cool thing, which is can hard I, to find. Can I throw something out at you? This is very much not about it, but I was thinking about it after we taped the Secret Invasion podcast. What would have been different about Secret Invasion if Nick Fury never came back to Earth, but Sonya Falsworth, Olivia Colman's character, was still there? Uh, that's what I think. I wish it was that. Right. Fury is such a question mark in that whole series. Mm-hmm. 
And at the end of the day, like we talked about, he literally just goes back to where he was with no change, mm-hmm. except his wife is sticking around for like a lunch. So it's like <laughs> not a whole thing. Sonia Falsworth in the series figured out absolutely everything that Fury figured out in a quicker amount of time was more effective about it and only in the last episode and a half basically stood back to let Fury do his thing and this is obviously fan fiction that I'm talking about here but if he had not been present she would have been able to more effectively take care of the entire situation. 100 percent fury yeah. slows especially in the last episode and there's a scene we won't spoil it i guess but there's a scene where it's like if she if fury was in there delaying the one thing that needed to happen <laughs> she would have done it immediately and we wouldn't yeah. have had it plus she kicks ass in the last episode anyway something that fury barely does yeah. even in the last episode wild all right why don't we move on to a more positive thing this is something we talked over about on our invincible podcast pod vincible but is spider-man going to show up in invincible season two now here's the clues for it if you're curious there was a comic book crossover between spider-man and invincible i believe this was when robert kirkman was doing marvel team up he brought in invincible there yeah there josh keaton who does one of the voices of spider-man is listed on the voice cast as a mystery character in invincible season two in addition prime video works with sony who has the rights to spider-man uh, and they're working on a bunch of spider-man shows invincible is on prime video and the last bit which we didn't talk about on the pod Invincible podcast but i'll throw out there is there's actually a frame when the character invincible is in a diner on his phone you can see the cover from the invincible spider-man team up issue there so they certainly seem to be tipping their hand about uh to this a little bit do you think it's gonna happen yeah i do but like i think mm-hmm. that 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 team up issue is a perfect way to do it the hardest part about anything like this is making sure all the corporations aren't going to be mad about even suggesting something like this and to what you just said it sounds like they are on board it makes sense for all of them these characters have met in in the media that inspired these these television this television show i say let's go it only Mm -hmm. helps it's a fun story anyway if they do the comic story so let's do it i hope so i think that would be a absolutely wild thing to do in the second season and i think after a hit first season that would help it only get bigger um so that would be super fun another piece of speculative spider-man news thomas hayden church says he's heard quote rumors of a sam raimi toby mcguire spider-man 4. did it go much farther than that uh, I am very skeptical of this. This sounds to me like Thomas Hayden Church has been asked about it a bunch of times or saw an article on like Cosmic Book News or something that was like Spider-Man 4 yeah. happening. Plus the fact that Sam Raimi was working on a Spider-Man 4 after Spider-Man 3 that got scuttled when Sony went in a very different direction and ultimately rebooted things with the Andrew Garfield movies. Uh, do you think there's any merit to this at all? The idea of like, this is like me being like, um, a rumor has it, I need a job soon. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> this is, I feel like this is him just like trying to to make the machine start turning in a way. Yeah. And I think he, I love Thomas Hayden Church. I loved him from back in his sitcom Wings. He's so funny Great. as Lowell. Shouts to Wings, one of my favorite shows uh, from back in the day. And so, like, I hope he gets more specifically comic book work. Mm-hmm. Um, the Sandman stuff was f- fine, but it was also a little very serious. Mm-hmm. Sandman, even the comics, is a villain who, like, is fun and weird and can be made made into a comedic thing. I would love to see him do something more like that, whether it's Sandman or something else. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely see. I don't think there will be any movement necessarily on this project at all. And also I'd throw out there, I think people need to stop asking questions in interviews like, would you like to do this thing? You know, hey, would you be interested yeah. in doing a Spider-Man 4? Because to your point, they'll be like, yeah, I like jobs. Sounds good. <laughs> Every well, I single think time. It's, a, it's a great like two part lie, like a little crime, little scam that's happening where it's like, I, the reporter, need a headline. You, the actor, maybe want a job. Let's collaborate on a quick line. One hundred percent. And mind you, I've done that in the past a lot of times yeah. because it's <laughs> a, you're like stretching for questions. You're like, what? What am I going to do here? Let me ask this guy this thing. But I'm really trying to get that out of my repertoire because, like we're saying, it's the same thing every time. I really wish. I really wish, as a journalistic industry, we would all stop doing that. But we won't. So there you go. Two quick last things here before <laughs> we wrap up. This is another secret invasion 
interesting thing. Dermot Mulroney was asked in an interview to react to Harrison Ford being the next president in the MCU. He said, that's bad <laughs> news. That's bad news. And then he's like, maybe I could be uh, I could be his vice president, right? I could do two terms as a president and then two terms as a vice president under President Harrison Ford. We talked about this a little bit on the Secret Invasion podcast, but... I have a lot of questions about how the presidency works in the MCU. I feel like that is the bottom tier of what they are keeping track of in any way, because every Ugh. other movie, it's like, who, who is the, this is a new person. How does this work? Yeah. What happened here? Well, and honestly, that to me, what like politics and presidents, it's part of any sort of fictional story where I'm like, this is where it touches reality and it pulls everyone out a little bit. I feel like when it's like, oh, the, he's the president. Oh, I wonder, you know, they couldn't get Biden. Could Biden wouldn't do the movie or the secret invasion or like it just there's there's something about it, I think, that touches reality in a way that takes us out of the story. And especially to do something like this where it's like, oh, he we have to consider an off camera election that Ritson is losing to a Harrison Ford president. I'm just like, God, this is way too much. much. I don't I don't want anything more than a reference to former President Ritson in uh, Captain America, New World Order or whatever they're calling Brave New World. Uh, no, thanks. Yeah. We don't need to get into it any further. It's fine. It does not need to be a mm -hmm. plot point. I will say I really like Dermot Mulroney. Like mm -hmm. he, he's out uh, picketing right now for the SAG strike, and he's very uh, he's super supportive. He's it seems to be like a very fun, self-effacing guy. So, and this feels like he's like, oh no, it's like he is Ritson being like our election campaign is failing, our election campaign is failing. He's <laughs> like, oh no, that's bad. I'm running against Ford. Hmm, he's good. Uh, what are we gonna do? Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens there. And one last quick thing, just a, a heads up for anybody who doesn't know, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is coming to Disney Plus on August 2nd. So if you've been waiting to watch it or you want to watch it again, it's going to be there, quote unquote, for free. Uh, Justin, are you going to check it out again? Are you going to watch the movie with your kids, you think? Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, they are maybe a little young, and we haven't watched Guardians. We've we've been sort of working yeah, our way through be. Star Wars. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of heavy. I don't know if they're ready for animal torture, just as a, <laughs> a cultural phenomenon. But uh, I'm excited to rewatch this movie. This movie mm -hmm. was very fun. Yes, I agree. It is between this and the Flash. Uh, I don't remember whether I told this story on this podcast or our Sons of the Gun podcast, but a guy I was talking to this morning at my son's camp was yeah. like, um, oh, I actually like The Flash better than Guardians of the Galaxy 3. And my son was like, well, he's wrong. So yeah. So we're going to watch it again as many times as that possible. Was, on that Disney was two Plus. kids in a trench coat, Alex. There's no way <laughs> oh, no. that was a real person. <laughs> oh, no. That was, that was uh, two Ezra Millers in a trench coat. It was what it probably was. <laughs> Classic Ezra. All right, why don't we wrap up here? And a reminder, if you got tips or stories you want us to cover, you can email us at comicbookclublive at gmail.com. Support us at patreon.com slash comicbookclub. Also, do we a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about Marvel. Apple, Spotify, not Stitcher, because Stitcher is going away at the end of August. If you're subscribed there, please subscribe any other major platform so you can keep getting the podcasts. But, uh, yeah, you can also check us out socially at Marvel Vision Pod, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, stay marvelous. And remember to get out there and vote in the upcoming Marvel <laughs> election because we got to get the right president in the Marvel fictional office. Ritson's my man. He's racist and I love it. <laughs>